We have a two-book trading watching. Wonderful. Awesome. Oh, Tom's Good. here? Oh, no. <laughs> He's, I thought for sure I was going to have some peace, but now I'm, I'm not completely. going to. All right. So, yeah. Just watching me to so, make sure I'm a good If you guys boy. are doing us live, just come in the chat. We want to make sure that we know who's watching. And if you have any question for at any time for Tom or I guess uh, for <laughs> Brandon or I, just comment below and we'll make sure to answer your question. We have Scott, welcome. Jay, uh, Alejandro, welcome. Awesome. So we have Brandon today. Brandon, tell, take a few minutes to introduce yourself, tell people who you are, what you do, and a little bit about your trading as well. Sure. That's uh, boy, that'll fill up the entire thing here. Um, so basically, I got started with your 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 basic I, I need to get rich quick kind of thing. I worked in a factory straight out of high school, um, just because the city I was born in that's what they did. You went to the factories, you went to university, and you got the heck out of Dodge. Um, and so I then wound up being a little bit disenfranchised with my existence. So I did what all Canadians do, they love to do, and I moved out west. I packed up packed up the misses, packed up the dog, the cat, went out went out west to Calgary and tried to live the Western lifestyle. Um, and then I answered an advert in a, I was just a, a wealth internet site, something like that said, want to make 300 or $30,000 to $300,000 trading stocks this year. I said, yeah, yeah, I do. So I, I applied to it, got a phone call back and I actually got a job doing that. Um, so my first day, uh, I actually started off as a statistical arbitrage and inefficiency trader. And for anyone who doesn't know what that is, I don't actually know what it means either. It just means that I was kind of a high frequency trader before high frequency is sort of a buzzword. And this would have been back in 2006 when I got started. And I did that for about five years. Um, but basically just looked for inefficiencies in the marketplace. I remember my first day, um, my boss sat me down. And he was like, so here's your buy button. Here's your sell button. If you lose $50, you're fired. So <laughs> I thought that was like, that's tough. great. I've got a few more stories about that place, but that was my introduction to don't lose money trading. Uh, so I learned very quickly to, to not lose money because I didn't want to get fired because I wanted to make the $300,000 a year that the advert said I could make. Um, so then I did that for about five years. And the inef after the financial crisis, the inefficiencies in the, in the, the equity world, and I was trading US equities like NASDAQ and, and um, NYSE, New York Stock Exchange, they really started to get too efficient. And so it became really difficult for me to compete with Goldman Sachs and their high frequency algorithms and all this other stuff. Like they were just making everything way too efficient. And uh, the prop industry went through a really big down cycle at that time. So I was looking for something else to do because I was used to making a certain amount of money and I, I wasn't making that. I wasn't losing, but it wasn't what I was used to doing. Couldn't really fund the life that I had created. So a friend of mine was doing a startup Forex brokerage here in Toronto where I live. Shout out to TO. Um, and so he said, come on in. You can, you know, it's, it was a high net worth uh, Forex brokerage. We only catered to like boutique kind of traders. You had to actually be uh, what we call in Ontario an accredited investor. Just basically means you have a net worth of a million dollars or you make a quarter million a year. Um, that's what they did because at the time CFDs back in, this was like 2011, I think. CFDs were, were not something that um, the regulators really knew much about. So anyways, I, I went there and I, I still doing a little bit of trading on my own, but this is my first kind of like foray into the Forex world. And it was really interesting because I got to see all the clients. We had about 200 clients because it was like supposed to be all high net worth people. So it was, it was a boutique brokerage, but not a single one made money. Like not a single, there were, there was times when you know, a few people would go on a tear and they would make some money, but then they would give it all back. And so I was kind of like the port of call for these guys. So like they expected a high level of service. So they wanted to call in and knew that they weren't talking to like a phone monkey. So, you know, I had all this experience trading so I could talk to them as if like, you know, we were peers and, and, you know, I, I didn't sound, you know, for lack of a better word, uneducated in the financial space. So I learned about all these guys and gals systems and in every single one of them were technical, technically based. And I knew that every single one of them lost money. Now, some of them were like very simple things like moving average crossovers, which we know only works in a trending market and the Forex market doesn't really trend very often, maybe 30% of the time. Um, and some of it was like as complicated as like seven different indicators piled together with like Ichimoku clouds, the Kassik oversoul, like all these other like things like I'd never heard of at the time because I had never actually studied technical analysis before then. Like I, like, Inefficiency trading has nothing to do with the numbers. It's it's actually you're trading ones and zeros against like big guys on level twos. You're not trading 
you know, breakouts or, or stochastic oversolds and that kind of thing. So I, th I find it was really interesting that they all lost money and they were all doing the same thing. Now, before I make it sound like I actually am demonized in technical analysis, I'm not, because I can tell you that take technical analysis out of the picture, the risk management was horrifying. Like, I will, a story about this, but I watched a guy go from six and a half million to 20,000 in under two weeks. Wow. So ask if anyone, if that's, if there was any proper risk management to that whatsoever. And so... There's not. So that was the biggest issue there, but they were still all using technical analysis for their buy and sell decisions. They just didn't make very good risk management decisions. So I kind of, um, go, going back to actually that story, and I know I'm killing a lot of time here, but it's, it's actually worthwhile to tell this. Um, that guy who was, who was um, um, it's, it's kind of how I learned the fundamentals in the first place. He was telling me about his system. And I was like, okay, well, I don't really want to make a technical forex system for myself because all these traders who are high net worth individuals who've been very successful in life they own businesses they you know these people are used to success well so i can't just say well those people are ridiculous because they're very successful human beings so i have to be like maybe the system was what was wasn't working now the risk management yes that was a problem but i decided that i wanted to do the exact opposite of what the technical analysis was so that's kind of how i i didn't know it at the time but i started getting into things like reading news and stuff like that to try to figure out what was actually driving the markets and all that kind of stuff because they weren't telling me about squiggly lines on a chart they were telling me about like what big central bankers were thinking and then i discovered whoa central bankers whenever they talk the forex market moves like crazy or whenever there's economic data the forex market moves like crazy so anyways that's how i got into um trading forex using fundamentals and sentiment over since that time it's i've kind of honed it into like uh, a very simple system for me to use that we can talk about now if you want did i answer your question i have no idea you know yeah, from yeah, yeah, for interviewing sure, for me sure. before i waffle on yeah, so, so I think that's where you kind of start to learn fundamentals more than technicals. And so what I'm curious, I, I know a lot of people want to learn fundamentals and sentiment. How did you teach yourself that? Did you read books or watch videos or how did that happen? Um, no, it, like I didn't know it at the time, but like it, I knew I just want to do exactly what the opposite of technicals was. Mm -hmm. And there's really no books out there on fundamentals. Like the book, okay, the books on fundamentals are university textbooks. That, that are like economics. Yeah. Because if you think about it, like central bankers are the ones that control interest rates and interest rates are what control the Forex market. So it makes sense that you wanna know what the dudes and the dudettes who are controlling the, the interest rates, you wanna know what it is that they do. And if anyone doesn't know what a, what a central banker is, they're, they're an economist, that's it. Like their job is to be an economist and manage an economy for whichever country they, they're managing. So I just went and started learning about economics. And I was like, well, how can I apply this down to something smaller so that I can trade this? Because I don't want to be, I don't want to, you know, I don't have a degree or anything like that. So I can't walk into Goldman Sachs and be like, hey, I want to be an economist, hire me, and then learn it that way. I had to go and just like figure it out by watching economic events and that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But I think one of the challenges for people who want to trade like you are trading today is that there's kind of a, maybe a lot of discretion into it. Like there, or some people might want to trade fundamentals, but they don't have any clear rules. So I kind of want to jump to your trading style and tell people what that looks like in terms of like time frame and a little bit of what you're looking for in the market as well. Sure. So the thing that I think really pushes retail traders off um, fundamentals is that it's not like technical analysis. Like technical analysis, you can pick up a book, you can read it in a weekend, and you can then take that into the market and you can start applying that. Like where it's, you know, for example, oversold or overbought indicators. It's very simple. It's black and white. If this happens, then you do that. Whereas with fundamental analysis, I can't tell you. Oh, hold on. My dog's having a little bit of spaz here. There we are. My dog hangs out with me in the, uh, the office. Um, with fundamental analysis, I can't actually sit here and be like, well, if this economic piece of data, so let's talk about non-farm payrolls because a lot of traders will understand non-farm payrolls. It's a really big event that typically moves, moves the US dollar and most other currencies as well pretty heavily. So I can't say to you, if non-farm payrolls comes out at 200,000, that that means you should buy or sell. Whereas with a technically based system, if this happens, then you should buy or sell. And I think that's, this is where we kind of get lost because 
the real power in fundamentals is when you've sat down and you've watched non-farm payrolls, the number that came out, and then the reaction to that number six months in a row. Because then you start to get some feels and some insights because you could get the, the non-farm payrolls could come out 200,000 every single month for six months. But that doesn't really mean anything because you don't know what the current market environment was thinking. So this is one of the most important principles that I could ever impart on a trader is uh, what the market expects. So whatever the expectation is for whatever it is, interest rates, a non-farm payrolls, jobs number, inflation, GDP, doesn't matter. Whatever the market expects is at the very least just as important, if not more, and I think more important than what actually happens. Because all markets are meant to be discounting mechanisms. Like I'm sure people have heard, if they've been around for any longer, uh, any amount of time, that like, you know, the stock market is a discounting mechanism that tries to discount, you know, three to six months in advance what, what the future economic prosperity of these companies are. Mm -hmm. Well, it's the exact same thing with the Forex market. They're trying to discount. So what they expect is what is going to push the price going into that event. So, the, so, that could be a week ahead of time. That could be three months ahead of time. It does. It just you have to understand what the market is thinking, like what it has inside its head. The only way you're going to do that is to research what's going on in the news. Mm -hmm. Now, some people, including perhaps myself, might say, "Well, the fundamentals and the sentiment are already like seen on the chart. You can already feel it on the chart." So, how would you respond to that? And why would researching about it and learning about fundamentals help you trade better? Okay, that's an interesting question. I don't think I've actually been asked that before, but like the kind of there's two schools of thoughts there. Like you're you're borderlining the um, who are those knuckleheads? It's the um, random walk theory. Random walk theory says that any piece of information that is already um, discounted into the price chart right. at any given time, and that there is no actual, at least they admit that they can't make money trading because that there's no way for you to have a statistical edge. Well, we know that's not true because there's people that make money. There's big giant asset management firms, head funds, like they don't just have trillions and trillions of dollars trading because they lose money for their clients. Like there is money to be made in the Forex markets. Now, um, saying that it's uh, going back to the question of like, how is it already priced in the chart? So think about, for example, and I'll give you like a longer term example that will maybe help make a bit more sense. So like going into like, um, let's say uh, when the European Central Bank, when they, before they did their quantitative easing program, um, for those who don't know what quantitative easing is, it is basically the unlimited printing of money in order to buy government securities to push a ton of money into the economy with the hopes that that'll spur buying and spending and that people will go out and spend because most most economies need consumer spending to actually be healthy. So if we go to the example of their quantitative easing program, they didn't just come out one day and be like, hey, hey markets, um, we're just going to start spending trillions of dollars right now. We're just going to start printing that and you know hope that the economy starts to pick up and do some things. They started giving hints to the market saying in their speeches and their press conferences, and they started giving hints saying, you know what? Stuff is bad right now. Like unemployment is like, what? It was 25% in Spain. It was like, just like, it was crazy how high unemployment was. Things are bad. We're worried about the evil deflation and we need to get things jump started. So we're thinking about doing something. And so the markets goes, cool. So we're a discounting mechanism. So we're going to start dumping the euros because we believe the central bank is going to make some really big policy action that is going to negatively affect the value of dollar. Like if you think about it, basic supply and demand, if you print more dollars than the real rate of um, demand happens, you're going, it's going to go down. The price is going to go down to meet equilibrium or a fair value. So in this example, the euro dropped 2,000 pips, if not more. And it's not like it did that instantaneously. So Random Walk would tell you that that, that would have been in the price of the charts instantaneous. But the only 2,000 pip move I've ever seen that was instantaneous was when the Swiss National Bank pulled the rug under the uh, the 120 euro Swissy uh, floor. That's the only time I've ever seen that happen personally. So like it's over a period of like eight months, it was like you just sold the dollar on a rally because you knew that it was things were, were looking really bad and they wound up having to increase their quantitative easing program. So it just, um, a lot of these words are big and they're kind of like, they may be a bit foreign to people, but when you hear them and see them over and over, it's, uh, it's, it starts to make a little more sense, but like it wasn't instantaneous. 
but you definitely could have used technical analysis if to get into it. Like this is what I tell people: if you don't um, like, because because I used to be really staunch and the technicals was for monkeys and all this other stuff, and now I realize that I'm wrong. Technicals is good, and I'm actually doing a lot to try to incorporate that into my own trading. But um, with with technical analysis, I just tell people whatever your system is, like doesn't matter. Just trade it, trade the signals or whatever you get that are in line with the fundamentals. And if you do that, you're going to put yourself in the power of, of where the money is pushing. Because if we know that there is, you know, the quantitative easing in, in Europe is happening, we know that the power of the big money is the institutions are selling. They're, they don't sell at the bottoms. They're looking to sell on the rallies to get a discount and to make more money when they push the price lower and lower and lower. So that's kind of what I tell people, only use your sell signal and that sort of thing. If you do a buy in that particular thing, like if stochastic gets oversold and you want to buy because of that, like, and you don't real and you get run over, like, you got run over because the power of the institutions, all that flow of money was saying, we're going down. We may go up for a little bit and maybe you get your five pips or whatever it is. But after that, we're going to go drop another hundred pips and we're all going to high five all the way to the bank and to the pub. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I so, answered your question there. Yeah. So tell me if I'm wrong. What I understand from this is that you don't trade fundamentals, but you trade kind of how people react to the fundamentals and the, the, the news, basically. Not the news itself. Is that, does that make sense? Yeah. And so it's a fair thing. Like, man, the fundamentals is like, well, let's define for a second the fundamentals. Like, yeah. the fundamentals is the big picture, like macroeconomic situation of an economy. So mm -hmm. think like the year long picture or the six month picture. Whereas what I do is I say, okay, cool. I understand that. So in our example here, European Central Bank, this is negative, I'm bearish, I want to sell, but then I, I'm a sentiment trader. So then what sentiment is basically the picture of the day today, like in this trading session, like what is the mood of the market right now and what is it telling me? Because it doesn't just go down in a straight line. There are many times during quantitative easing program where the price of the Euro USD or any other Euro pair went up hundreds of pips. And, and then, but that was just a selling opportunity. So like, that that going up 100 pips was the sentiment so the mood had switched and it and the sentiment could have been very simply the big banks were taking profits like they were selling it all the way down so in order for them to take profits they have to buy it back up right and so that that's what that sentiment could have been or it could have been that for a moment there was a really good gdp number that happened and so the, the sentiment changed for a little bit but then they realized one good number doesn't in a series of 10 20 bad numbers does not mean that the trend is going to change, if you know what I'm saying there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so totally get that. And so what does the daily routine look like to be able to get that sentiment or that kind of picture of the market on a daily basis? Cool. Yeah. So when I wake up, the first thing I do is I open Ransquawk. Uh, I have Ransquawk is it's a premium service, it costs a bit of money, but uh, it does all the heavy lifting for me. It's not necessary, but you can, you can get uh, from other sources like Forex Live. They do a fantastic job. Adam Button, also another Canadian. Hashtag legend. Um, he's kind of the head at, head piece at uh, Forex Live. So go to them, get their, like, it's all free. But I use Ransquawk. And what they do is they have a, um, a morning preview of what has happened overnight. And it takes me about five minutes to read through it. And boom, I already know exactly what's happened overnight. Um, the British, um, the UK have released CPI numbers. And I know exactly what it is. So I haven't even looked at a chart right now. So I, I identify whatever they tell me has happened with either good or bad. And now, and now I know what currencies that I want to go look at. So then I'll pull up my trading platform and I'll see, okay, so for example, we got bad CPI data for the UK this, this week and we got bad retail sales. Both of those are super important to, to you know the, the price of the pound. And if anyone saw the pound this week, it got butchered, it got killed, right? Mm -hmm. So I already know exactly what I want to trade. So guess where I had most of my trades this, this week, I was trading pound short because I knew that CPI was terrible and retail sales was terrible and there's been some hiccups with Brexit and all that kind of stuff. So that I just find out what the sentiment situation is, go to the charts, confirm that it's happened. And then I see, is there a good level for me to get in? Boom. So, so I really like the process. So you look at kind of the basic fundamental aspect and then go back to the chart with some more details set up on your chart. Yeah, like I, okay. I don't even need charts. Well, I lie, I lie. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. That was mean. I, I don't ever look at my charts first. Like uh -huh. I intentionally turn my charts off at night when I go to bed, but I leave my Ransquawk open because 
I don't want to be biased. I don't want to flip open my charts and be like, oh, the Aussie dollar dumped. Oh, well, uh, something happened with Australian dollar. Like, no, no, I want to know exactly what happened first. And then I confirm that with the price action on the chart. And then I, then I use, you know, whatever, you know, I, I don't use very sophisticated technical analysis, but if there's a good level for me to get into it, then I, then I will. Uh -huh. Are this information useful kind of over the days or is it only for the next day? Can you use them for like the next week or the next month or for more swing trade type of stuff? Um, yeah, yeah. This is where, this is where the answer is going to be kind of, uh, not the best. Once you, once you learn what fundamental event what 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 that happens once you learn which one is going to impact the markets the most that's how you know how long something could last because the one thing about with fundamentals and sentiment is the market is very it's very simple it can only concentrate on one or two things at a time so if it like when we're talking this week like cpi was bad in, in the uk so they sold it off and then they couldn't really think of much else what else would we going to do with with the uh, the british pound and then the retail sales came out the next day and they sold off like yeah right so everything's bad but how would you know that retail sales is going to affect the market of uh, the pound that much well, it's because you, you've had some experience watching what retail sales numbers do and um like bigger events like interest rate changes those are going to affect the individual currencies far more than let's say um, housing permits is another piece of economic data that comes out in most countries that doesn't really move the market, which I guess brings me to another point that like, I also know that what I want to focus on in the, in this particular time is what the central bank has told me that they're focused on. And so they do that on their websites. They do that in their speeches. You can see this on Forex live. They tell you whenever, you know, um, Jerome Powell speaks, he's the head of the Federal Reserve, they tell you exactly what he said and whether it was hawkish or dovish, which is either bullish on interest rates or, or bearish on interest rates, they tell you exactly what it is. And then you get to kind of a feel for, is this important kind of deal. Mm -hmm. What I feel, especially with these speeches, is that it can be kind of a little bit ambiguous sometimes. So they say something, we don't know if it's going to be useful or not, or how far it's going to impact things. So do you kind of interpret yourself or I guess you look at the resources to help you get a feel of what that looks like on the bigger picture? Well, a lot of it comes down to like what the market is thinking and you understand what the market is thinking by what is actually in the news. Mm -hmm. Like people, like, so for example, Forex Live, I highly encourage people to, to check out their stuff. They're awesome. And they do a session wrap just like Rand Squawk does and that kind of thing. So you can get that stuff. Like they're not going to post stuff that is irrelevant to what the market is doing. They're not going to tell you about something that has no value to your to the impact of the price of currencies. They're going to tell you about stuff that's going to move the markets, uh, move the particular currencies, and they're going to give you the exact reasons why. And then sometimes they even give you uh, opinions or analysis on where it may go from here. So they're not going to talk about rubbish. They're only going to talk about the stuff that's affecting the currency prices right now. So that's how you're going to get, like that's kind of how you take ambiguity out of it, is that you understand what is being focused on by the markets. And that is what is being written about. Mm -hmm. Cool. We have a few good questions in the chat, but if you have any question to ask Brandon, then come into the chat. We want to make sure that we answer them. And th the best life we do are the one if you will ask questions because then we can focus on what you want to hear most and want to learn most, want to learn the most. So come in there and we'll make sure to cover your question right after. Now we have a question here that I want to kind of cover. Uh, you probably got an answer for that which is where can you find the main areas that the central bank are focusing on? Like the main thing that they work on and they plan to act on. Where can we find this? Cool. So there's a few things in there. The first thing is I'll just, this is the, um, the central bank will tell you what they're focusing on first off. And there's two ways that they do that. One, you go to the website. So you can go to the reservebank.com, whatever it is. Um, and they will actually tell you what they are in their pages, what they're focused on, but that's you know difficult and who wants to do that? The, the other thing is they will tell you in their press conferences and their speeches. And there's been a lot, and you can just go to the Forex factory calendar and you can see that there's you know Jerome Powell's speech today or whoever Mario Draghi has a speech today and they'll even tell you where it's at and what it's about. Now in those speeches, they give you these little things called forward guidance. Ooh, big word there. <laughs> and all that means is that they're dropping little nuggets to tell you what they're thinking. And so going like so going back to that um, example of the European Central Bank and the quantitative easing, like I said, they didn't just come out and be like, 
yo guys, we're going to do this super big multi-trillion euro um, quantitative easing program. Mic drop, I'm out. Like that's not what they did. For months leading into it, they started to tell you we're concerned with these certain things. We're concerned with how high unemployment is. We're concerned with the debt ratios, all that stuff. And then they they changed their wording over time to make it more positively phrased or negatively phrased. That's forward guidance. The best central bank in the world for forward guidance is the is the Federal Reserve, bar none. The, and once they have a speech, you just go to Forex Live after, and they will tell you if wording has been removed or if they've added more wording that makes it more positive or 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 negative towards the uh, the currency. Like they're they're going to tell you where it is, and the, they tell you so much that the market usually knows exactly when they're going to raise interest rates and what month to a very high degree because they've told them so many little clues. Mm -hmm. Love that. And that's, I think, a really useful resource. Cool. Now, I'm going to assume that some people hear about fundamentals and they think that this is kind of the science that's going to make all the trades successful. Like they're going to follow what the news say or what these people say. And inevitably, they're going to, they're going to be right. So I'm kind of curious to know, and this can be kind of an, an average or whatever, but how often are you right on your trades or you, like what do you think is going to happen with the trades? That's a tough question because there's so many different kinds of trades. Uh -huh. Like um, my, my bread and butter this year so far has been trading the Donald Trump. And okay. This is a very fast sentiment trade. Like uh, we were talking uh, off air before we went live, right. and I'll read it to you. What? Yeah, maybe, maybe show, show that again. So yeah, it's. Let me just let me just pull that up here. So, um, at uh, six fifty seven a.m. Eastern time, and I have um I have my uh, Twitter program to give me an instantaneous push notification when Donald Trump makes a tweet because it, I need to know. Like <laughs> that's he, that's he affects yeah. the markets. Um regardless of my opinion on him. But here's what he wrote at 657. Looks like OPEC is at it again with record amounts of oil all over the place, including the fully loaded ships at sea. Oil prices are artificially very high, no good, and will not be accepted. And so my, uh, my brain says, oh, well, he is basically bullying the price of oil. So I straight away, I just flipped to my oil chart, smashed short uh, oil. So, and... Over about, um, I don't know, if you look at a price, the chart of oil today, you'll see that there was a bit of a shock reaction that happened um, exactly at 6.57 Eastern time. And so I got it. I got it. It just, it just reacted. It knee jerk reaction over three minutes dropped 30 cents. And then over about, about 30, 40 minutes, it dropped almost a full dollar based on those comments. And so because I've been, um, I've been playing with the markets for so long with this whole fundamental thing. Like my brain just instantaneously recognized that that was a negative thing coming from who is likely one of the most powerful human beings on planet earth. I mean, and he's in the, he's in a position of power, like whether we agree with that or not, like the United States is a superpower. So that's important information. So if he says stuff like that, boom, like think about it, us Canadians here, like NAFTA, like you've heard all about like Trump gets on there and he starts doing this about, oh, we're going to leave NAFTA and all this other stuff. Think about what that means for the price of a currency. Mm -hmm. If, if all of a sudden we stop getting this revenue as Canada coming from NAFTA, what's that mean? It means our, it means it's going to affect the tax that the country's going to generate. It means the price, the value, the, the value of our currency will go down to adjust for all these losses that we're going to have. So what's the first thing you think about when Trump comes out and says, Oh, guess what? We're going to leave NAFTA. Screw all you guys. We're going to do what we want to do. You go to the dollar, you go to, you go to the Canadian dollar and you short it. You, you plug your nose and you walk away and you go, you know, go for lunch and come back and the currency will be lower. Like that was the way it was when he first started talking about NAFTA. Now, the market has thick skin. And so if someone keeps saying the same thing over and over and over and over, the first time it came out, maybe it has a huge reaction. The second time, maybe it has a little bit less of a reaction. By the time we get to where we are with Trump and NAFTA right now, I mean, we're, we've heard there's been 6,000 tweets and all kinds of speeches. Like it doesn't budge unless there is something very ironclad that we haven't heard before. If he just says uh, NAFTA negotiations are rubbish, we're going to leave, it's not going to make much of a, a difference because we've heard that over and over. Mm -hmm. But if he comes out with some sort of something that we haven't heard, and that's that's when you have to be in tune with the market and what's actually been happening because 
you would need to know what we've actually heard beforehand. Because otherwise, if you haven't, then it's new information to you and you might want to react on it. So if new information comes out, well, that's tradable information. Mm -hmm. So you talk about NAFTA, if you want to trade the peso or you want to trade the CAD, bang, do it. I, th I think that's a great example. But now with that first example with Donald, with, uh, Donald Trump, how would you place your stop loss and kind of risk management on that? Okay, so for me, um, my stop loss is price action. Like okay. if I punch into it, and if I expect there to be a big price move because I think this is scary, like today, um, I didn't have any fear because I punched into it and it just trickled down. Like it kept over three minutes, I got my 30 cents out of the oil trade, but it I could have held on for a lot longer, but I waited until the price action itself so I'm putting I'm putting Etienne to sleep here. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I knew it was going to happen. Um, if I if I start seeing that the price action is starting to go back up, then then I'm just going to get out because that tells me that the sentiment and in this case the sentiment is super super fast. Like it could be this that only lasts for two minutes, right? So it's all about the price action. If things just start going against me immediately, I'll just punch out. Mm -hmm. And would you be putting a stop loss above the recent high of the stages for safety or uh, no? For for me, I don't have a stop loss because it yeah. it is it is a short term instantaneous trade. This thing's either going to go or it's not, and if it doesn't go, then I just punch out and I take whatever loss or whatever small winner I have, um, and I I just sit there and I'll watch it and see if momentum starts coming in. Because sometimes it's not just one comment. Like with Trump, we we know that he doesn't usually just tweet one tweet and go away. He comes out with five tweets in a row. So you never like, by the time we get to the third tweet, it could totally have negated everything that happened in the first tweet. So you, you got to kind of be like in tune with it's actually happening real time. It's not a strategy that you can just be like, I'm going to set it at this level and then forget it. It's going to be like you, you punch in instantaneously and you monitor what's happening. And that's why exactly why I, I pay a bit of an extra um, fee to have Rand squawk because they're going to tell me instantaneously. They're going to squawk off on the on the feed uh, over my speakers when something changes. So a lot of times I'll just wait for, for that to happen. If nothing happens, then I wait for the sentiment to change. What could just be its price starts going the opposite direction. Right, cool. And we have a good question here from Matthew that I think you're going to answer with that. So. Are there any other sentiment or fundamental tools that you use apart from the news, such as, let's say, options or bond price that you look at? Yeah. Okay. So um, I have, so Forex Live have mentioned, um, if you go to their website, and I don't have any ownership of Forex Live, so I'm just telling you what I actually personally use. There's no money here that I can make on it. If you were on a PC, you just, um, when, it, when you go to the website and it says, will you allow... Uh, Forex Live to send you push notifications, click yes, because it is fantastic. Because every time that they they release an article, which is like some days it's like 40, 50 times a day, um, you'll get a push notification to your desktop and you can set that up to have a sound alert and whatever. And you can instantaneously see the headline. And if I'm honest, like I pay a premium to have Ransquawk, but Forex Live beats Ransquawk a lot of the time on certain wow. things. The only the only thing that Ransquawk has is it has an audio. So you have these, the, the British fellas are on there telling me when things are actually happening rather than me reading stuff. So I get both. So like Forex Live and Ransquawk, absolutely. But there is a cheat for that. Um, there is um, anyone who, ha what brokers, you know, like, you know, MetaTrader 4, everybody knows MetaTrader 4. Mm -hmm. um, basically brokers lease that for MetaQuotes. Well, there's another company called X Open Hub, and um, uh, some forex brokerages like XTB they actually lease that from uh, lease X Open Hub's trading platform from from X Open Hub. So, in that trading platform, they actually have a live squawk feed built into it. I think it's called X Trader or something like that. I mean, you have to ask your broker if they have it, but they actually have a live squawk built into it. So that's a super good um, feature to have. So that's another place that you could get that information. Financial Juice has a real, uh, of, um, I think it's a two minute delay news feed, which is better than nothing, right? If you don't want to, yeah. if you don't want to pay the extra money, or if you don't, if you're not at that stage yet where you can afford to pay for that, that's a free one. Um, and then the only other, the only other source that I use is like I have Bloomberg, um, just the regular website Bloomberg forward slash currencies or something like that. Just on my phone, I get uh, push notifications whenever they come out with something. But Bloomberg is not 
fast like Forex Live. It's not real time. It's when you want to, when a big events happened, like, I don't know, Donald Trump dropping bombs on Syria or whatever event in the market, you know, four or five hours later, you're going to get excellent analysis of what happened. Is it tradable in that time? Probably not, but you get really excellent analysis from really good analysts. Forex Live, though, they're just, they're amazing analysts. They do a good job and they're fast. So that's, to me, it's, that's my go-to. Mm -hmm. Out of curiosity, are there any kind of TV channel you look at? So <laughs> I guess not CNBC, but let's say Bloomberg TV or something. Um, not really. Uh, I, sometimes, well, when there's like a central bank speech coming on, I'll go to a station that has it because I want to see like what it is. Usually, I can find it over the internet. Um, and a lot of times, they have it on YouTube, and most of the times, they'll actually have central banks will have their webcasts on their website. So you can like go to the Reserve Royal Bank of Australia and you can usually they'll have a webcast on there. The Federal Reserve has a web webcast on theirs, but no, most of the time I'm listening to house music. Me, me and Lulu, my dog over here, I'm trying to dub out her snoring and uh, we're just listening to house music, waiting for the squawks to come and watching, watching what's going on in the markets. Cool. And so how long do you let this information affect you on your trades, like the information from the say news? Do you have a time where you say, okay, this is like, this is too late, dude, this is gone? Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Like, again, that goes back to like the degree of the impact that the news is going to have. Mm -hmm. So let's go to expectations, okay? Go to non farm payrolls because that's one of the biggest um, economic data releases in the month. If the market expects, let's say, 300,000 jobs created this month and it comes out minus 500,000 jobs, like that is, that is, mind-blowingly horrible. The market was expecting 300,000. It came up minus 500. That's an 800,000 difference. That, that's, that is the height of insanity. The market will, well, the US dollar will go poo-poo. It will go straight down in a straight line, and it will probably continue to go down for what most people would look at and say is far, is too unreasonable. Whereas if, if it was expected at 300,000 and it came out at 300,000, then the price movement is going to be much less. So if I want to trade the, the 300,000 comes out of 300,000, I expect much less than if there was that massive deviation. I expect much, much more if there's the huge deviation. Um, and that just takes time to understand. Yeah. Like some indicators, they don't, the, a big deviation isn't really that big of a deal because the indicator itself isn't necessarily that important. But for something like non-farm payrolls, GDP data, CPI, like that kind of stuff, um, consumer price index, sorry, CPI, that um, that's going to move the market a lot more because it has an imp a material impact on what central banks will do with interest rates. If that makes sense. Did I explain mm -hmm. that? Yeah, 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 for sure. And Matthew wants to know, what do your charts look like in terms of like indicators? Do you look at volume, oscillators? And um, what, 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 also what kind of time frame you look at? Cool. I don't know, did you want to see my charts? Can you flip the thing here? Or? Sure, I think you can share your screen. Yeah, yeah. If you want, yeah. that could be cool. It's going to be kind of a, a green uh, button at the left left hand side of your screen. Uh, green button. No, this might be way too sophisticated for me. Oh, on the left hand side. Yeah. Oh, share screens. Look at that technology. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm fine. I'm gonna I'm gonna share I'm gonna share this one. Yeah. Cool. There you go. So you guys are gonna have a look at its chart. Let's take a look at that. There you go. That's what my charts look like. Oh, I can see it on this screen too. Holy Etienne, you are just, you are bringing me to the forefront of futuristic technology. <laughs> I am mind blown right now. You're going to have that to get me out of this too because um, I'm sure Tom is probably laughing at me right now because he knows how bad I am with technology. <laughs> so uh, to answer your question, normally my trading time frames are 15 minute, 10 minute chart. Um, you can't get 10 minute on MT4. But this is basically, this is a four hour chart of the do dollar Swiss. I usually look at one hour charts, my indicators. So let me do something here. Let's get real. Let's get real sophisticated here. Let's do this. Just give me one sec. I'm just pulling up something here. Boom. Boom. Cool. So this is one of my indicators. This line right here, all that is, is a double zero line. So that's telling me that this is 0.9700. And the reason I have that indicator on my charts is because 
if you think about um, where the most liquidity in the markets is, um, the big bankers, the big hedge funds, they're all looking at these double zero numbers because there's the most liquidity there, the most stuff they can do business, uh, do business and make transactions with other other firms. Like even just looking at it, like this line is also the 9600 line, but just look at how these market reacts. Yeah. Here. Like this is important information. It comes back down here. It's important. Like here, there's a big battle that takes place basically at that number. That's not random. Like here, you can see there's some wicks right there. Here, like it almost gets there. It's these numbers are important. Like there's a reason why, um, you know. Well, that's that's why I watch them because it's very obvious that those numbers mean something. Let me just see if I can get all these off here. Uh, boom. Cool. So that's kind of um, how I, 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 that's my one indicator. The other one I have is this uh, down here. So it's whoop. And this is what I look at right here. These numbers, average daily range. And so what you see, on, I don't even know what all this stuff means. I have no idea what that means. I just, I just have this indicator. I don't know what room up or room down means. I, I, have, I have no idea. So I don't pay any attention to it. But um, I just look at this. So today, if I'm thinking about buying or selling the uh, dollar Swiss pair, all I'm going to do is say, okay, we're, we move an average of 58 pips. Where are we today? Like how many pips have we gone today? And you can see here, if this is 100 pips from here to here, I can just visually see then from here to here, this is probably somewhere in the neighborhood of that 58 pip range. And I obviously would want to be long this this currency pair because it is going up in a very nice, beautiful fashion. I'm not going to get in right now. There's no reason for me to get in right now when we've done our average daily range. And all that's going to tell me is that we could have a potential uh, pullback because things just don't go up in a straight line, as you see. Um, and this is actually, let's see, the, there we go. go to a four hour. Like, this is just a beautiful trend. Like, Oh. Do you have an idea of like how, like what period that uh, average daily range is calculated on? Is it like fourteen days or? Yeah. So over here, over here, they, here they've got the, uh, the 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 numbers. So this is the previous one day range. Okay. So that was yesterday. This is the five day. This would be the these guys down here would be the the ten and the twenty day, and it just gives you an overall average of all of those combined. Excuse me. So you can see that like 58 pips is roughly the overall average um, spanning out to 28 days or sorry, 20 days. I don't need to look any longer than 20 days because what happens six months from now isn't necessarily going to impact us today. If we're talking about fundamentals and sentiment, like sentiment, we're talking about what's happening today. So to me, that's those are the only two indicators I have on my chart and neither of them are actual indicators. One just tells me that how many pips a currency pair typically moves. The other tells me where the double zero lines are. That's it. Nothing Pretty much else. what we call price action. I love that. Yeah, 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 exactly. The only other thing too I use is I use this. Um, it's a spread indicator. So it, I don't, because uh, I do trade around news events, sometimes the spread uh, will widen up quite a lot. So I don't necessarily want to get into, you know, if this says something like uh, 98, you know, that means like that's, that's 9.8 pips is what that is. So this is actually 0.6 pips. Um, cause it, it measures in the fifth decimal place. So like 0.6 pips, that's fine. That's pretty normal for, for dollar Swiss on my pair. And then the only other thing I, I use is this, I need to have, um, my regular, uh, I just need to have my buy and sell button up because like, if you go back to the example of the Donald Trump, um, he comes out and says something about oil. Like I, I can't like be flipping around trying to figure out where, where my buy and sell key is. I I just need punch long, punch short, done like that kind of thing. And so that's it. I guess that's four things I have on my chart. Um, but you'll notice I don't have any anything else. Um, even if you go to any of my other charts here. Oh, well, I lie. I lie. Um, on, on the 15 minute chart, so my trading time frame. Um, so I, I still have the same indicators here. But on the 15 minute chart, you see, um, let me just get, out of, get rid of some of this stuff here. On the 50 minute chart, you see that I've got this stuff. Like, what is all this? So this is the daily central pivot. You know, the only reason I have that on my chart is because a lot of the, the big bankers, a lot of the people will, um, they look at that stuff. Do I trade them? Not really. Like I don't make a trade because the price is at, um, uh, you know, 
the daily central pivot. And these are these are the other ones. This is your support one. Um, if you go out, if I make this a little bit smaller here, you can see, you know, you can see the um, the S1, the S2, the S3, same thing with the resistance. So support one, support two, support three. These are just mid mid ones. I, I don't pay any attention to them whatsoever. I really only pay attention to the one, this one right here. That's the only one that for me it makes any difference. And the other thing too is yesterday's high and yesterday's low. Uh, a lot of times you can see that price will react uh, off that off those numbers because it's it's an important number when you're talking about uh, price action. Like for example, look what happened here. You've got that double zero line that we talked about right here, and you've got yesterday's high. So when market came down to it, it had a sharp reaction off it. Now, I don't know, I wasn't watching the Euro today. I don't know why the Euro did what it did at this particular thing, but that's that's important pieces of information. Yesterday's yeah. high. If there's a reaction off it, then what you know is that other traders are trading it, and specifically the traders with enough money to affect price change in a currency pair. Mm -hmm. And those are probably going to be great take profit level or stop loss level. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. For sure. Like if you see that, especially if you have confluence, like... There, there's there's the odd time where I will use a Fibonacci. Um, if you have like a like a, a Fibonacci retracement, you know, right here in this area where there's, you know, yesterday's high, there's a double zero level, there's Fibonacci, there's all this other kind of daily central pivot. It just tells you that there's more more confluence at that area, and you can have a little bit more confidence to do that stuff. That is the whole Fibonacci thing is kind of like what I'm currently working on to try to help myself define a little bit more of where we are in the market. It's not something that I've really actively incorporated into my, uh, my trading just yet. Love that. that. I think we need to wrap this up, but uh, any other advice you'd have for people to finish this up or any other things you want to mention? Um, yeah. I mean, I'm sure I made, do you want the controls back here? Yeah, sure. You can just go back to uh, stop sharing your screen and get it back to the camera. Wonderful. Ah! Well then. All right. Yeah, so the only thing that I would say um, for people is that I know this is a little bit confusing, but it takes a lot of time to work with uh, to, to understand the actual um, fundamentals and sentiment. And what I'll say is that this is this kind of stuff that the big banks are using. Like, it, it's not, now, this isn't 100% of the case, but 99.9% .9 of the cases, they're using economic data to, to push the prices up and down and do all that stuff. They're not using... Um, stochastics and oversold and all that kind of stuff. Like, could you imagine George Soros being like, I need to wait for the MACD to be, to have a zero trend line break and the Ichimoku cloud to be flying above price and the stochastic to be oversold before I'm going to consider buying the Euro dollar right now. That's just not point. how it works. Yeah. And I'm not, I'm not mean to be, well, I am poking fun, but um, it's just the reality of what it is. So that is the stuff that they would do. The other thing that I would say that, that for me really um, changed a lot about the way I think about risk management. And I, I think I even mentioned this on your podcast last time uh, Tom and I were on, is that the size of your account today has absolutely zero m measure on your future earning potential. And what I mean by that is if you can make 2 or 3% per month with a very low drawdown of 2 1 to 3% a month, and you can do that on something that let's, let's say is like a sustainable amount, like 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 pips, not like scalping because you can't scale scalping. Scalping, you can only get to, like if you're taking three, four, five pips, you can only get to a certain amount bef of contracts before you get slippage and it's gonna affect your business model. But if you can actually trade for like 30, 40, 50 plus pips and learn how to do that, you can scale that up to any amount. You can start a managed accounts program because you think about it, like PIMCO is one of the, is one of the largest asset management firms on planet earth. They have $2 trillion under management. How, what return do you think they get for their clients? What, what do you think? A few percent, even <laughs> two, two per year? Two, yeah. 2%. Wow. Like, you're, you're all even, that, like that's what they're getting. So if you can make 2% per month, which is totally achievable, it's just as long as you don't go crazy. Because one of the things that I think people do is they come to Forex and they, they hear about all this leverage that you can use and all this other stuff. They come with kind of an expectation of changing their financial situation overnight when really it's a long-term game. Like fundamentals, I didn't learn fundamentals overnight. I can learn a technical system overnight, but I can't learn how the actual fundamentals work. I have to sit and play with it for six months. So it's a very different thing. So just if you trade your account like a real professional rather than leveraging up and trying to change your financial situ situation straight away, you do you, you, you can have 
people like invest in you. You can start your own company. Like there's so many different ways you can go. Yeah, there's big potential. So if you guys would value from this slide, please give it a like. I would really appreciate it. And I, th I think Brandon Lucas is going to love it too. And Brandon, you have also a free fundamentals course. So give just tell people where you can find this and get it. Sure. Yeah. So uh, on tubelokestrading.com, um, Tom and I are putting together, uh, well, Tom's the technology behind it. I'm the uh, the financial information guy behind it. We're currently in the process of building out a uh, fundamentals and sentiment trading uh, course. It's all free. There's no, there's no charge whatsoever. You can log in if you want to give us your email. We don't spam you, but um, you can log in and you can track your progress. Now there's about I think there's eight tranches of information that are going to come out. We've, we should have the third one released this weekend. Um, but by the time you get to tr about a month out from now, when it's completely finished, it'll have full-blown trading strategies. So it'll make all this random techno garble that I've thrown up on you guys today. It'll make it all sound much more understandable. You'll be able to get a, a lot more flavor to it. So there'll be trading strategies and why all these things affect the market. It's, it's going to be huge. That's good. Cool. And it's free. Wonderful. And if, if Tom is here, maybe you can drop a link in the chat and we'll make sure to put it in the, uh, the, under the description as well after the, the live is done. Sure. That could be cool. Awesome. So Brandon, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. And I uh, will catch you guys pretty soon. Cheers.